Lord, thank you for this time uh, where we can get together, even online like this, Lord. There are, I guess, pros and cons. Um, the fact that it's very convenient, but at the same time, it's not as good as actually meeting face to face. But uh, thank you for this, and Lord, I do pray that more of those who want to go into your word together, who love fellowship in the Lord, will we'll be able to get together, to be edified together, share things and build one another up, learn and grow. Lord, uh, be with each person. I hope we have learned good things from this study on prayer. Um, I, I, I pray and I hope that our prayer life has been good. Our time with you, Lord, the fact that we have access to the living God, the fact that even now you are hearing my prayers, the fact that you are hearing your people's prayers all over the world. They're like incense before you, they go up to you, and how you love to hear from your people, not because you're desperate or you have some need or anything, but just because you love your people and you love hearing from your people. Thank you for that. And Lord, may whatever is biblical go out today, um, be received as we look into your word uh, on how the Apostle Paul prayed and other things. Uh, please teach us, help us to learn what we can learn. Make us more useful to you, Lord, the short life we have. And Lord, be with us uh, spiritually, but also physically, to be well, and uh, so that we wouldn't have any hindrances in serving you, Lord, and doing your will. So thank you for this time, and I pray in uh, Jesus' name. Amen. So like a little bit of review, uh, we saw that, you know, we need to get our understanding of prayer from the Bible, just like everything else, what prayer is, what it looks like, uh, examples in different contexts, and also having the right understanding of like theology, truth. And uh, from scripture, we from seeing prayer being heard and answered, like last week we kind of saw this, but how prayer quote unquote works how like we saw the example of David when he when his son Absalom had rebelled dethroned him sort of semi David was running away and his loyal friend was on his side David's side and he came with him but then David's like you know what is what good is it for you to come with me uh, basically be like a spy on Absalom's side, uh, like like you're joining him. And uh, that one man, his name is kind of long, but that extremely wise counselor, you know, it says that his counsel was like hearing from God. He's extremely wise. Uh, and that counselor guy, he was on Absalom's side. And so David prayed, oh God, make his counsel like turn into foolishness or something. He prayed that in that situation, but he also sent his loyal friend. And then, you know, we, we saw what happened that, that, that uh, very wise guy, he gave really good counsel to overthrow David. Like you got to do it now. Like this is the only like really good chance. You can't miss this. Make sure you give me an army, give me a large army. I'll go and he'll be destroyed. And that probably that would have happened basically, because David was in a devastating, you know, devastated situation with like they're all absolutely down. I think they're weeping. It says they're like weeping and they're just down. You can't fight like that in that kind of condition. But um, Absalom, after hearing such wise good counsel, he asked that loyal friend, uh, "How about you? You know, do you have any advice?" And he totally flips it and says actually the opposite. Right now, your David is absolutely furious, and if you go, you're not going to win. And so, while David's actions are involved, God does answer prayer. I would say how God works is Absalom asking that question about a, a new, you know, advice, a different advice uh, to that 
spy friend? I, I would say that's a part of the answer. The fact that, you know, God basically had him ask that question and then his friend, David's friend, um, giving that opposite counsel. And then all the crowd, all the people there, like they were like, oh, that's a wonderful, great counsel. That was God's answer to prayer. And so through that, they totally lost their chance. And that wise counselor, he knew, oh, it's over. Nothing's going to work. And he ends up he ends up hanging himself, he ends up killing himself, because he knew, Absalom, you're doomed. You're not gonna win. It, it's over. It's a failure, and that's exactly what happens. So, we see how prayer is answered like that. Uh, sometimes we have our actions be involved. So, for example, you know, I also shared like my situation one time where I was looking for a job, and uh, not only did I apply. And, you know, I prayed, Lord, please let this work out. But I also uh, called the place. And then when I called them, I still remember that, that lady. She was like, yeah, why don't you come in for an interview? And then I got the job and that kind of thing. So when we see scripture, we come to learn about these things. You know, sometimes there are people uh, who would be like, like that, that's a lack of faith. If you end up doing too much like that, you're not, you know, you're not having faith in God. Once in a while, I meet people like that. It's very once in a while. Um, I, I heard of a, I think I heard about this actually. I don't think I actually met the guy, but like he said, like, um, he doesn't wear a seatbelt <laughs> because that's a lack of faith. So, um, like by scripture, we come to have the correct understanding of how things work, when to pray, in what situation prayer, what actions should be involved, that we don't just sit around and then just pray, oh God, give me a job. And then, you know, expect somehow for God to answer and like get a job. Sure, God can do the impossible, but uh, yeah, from scripture, we, we construct a correct understanding. Also, we saw theology that uh, like hyper -Cal Calvinism kind of thing where, well, if God already decided who he's going to save, then there's no point in praying, praying for people's salvation or evangelism because God already chose from the beginning of the world, the foundation of the world, who's, who he's going to save. So wrong theology results in no praying. <laughs> this is asked, you know, where, well, if God already predestined, then what, you know, why would prayer count? Because God already predestined everything. And so like, prayer, it wouldn't make any change. Absolutely wrong. Uh, you do not have because you do not ask. Uh, James 4, 2, 3-ish. And so, the fact that uh, understanding God's Word, knowing God's Word is extremely important to have the right foundation to, you know, in knowing how, how prayer works and all that stuff. And uh, You know, closet prayer versus you know, while doing something else, you know, I, I'm really thankful because last year, I know ar around Thanksgiving time, uh, we we did a study on uh, the topic of Thanksgiving. I hope we got some things from that, but First Thessalonians 5 where it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. I know we would have gone over that, in everything give thanks. And um, always being thankful that thing and you know I, I hope this is true for all of us that because uh, I'm just sharing what was true it, it's not a big deal in a way I mean in, in a way it's, it's important but just you know throughout the day it just randomly like sometimes you know I'm, I'm in my bed and it's very very comfortable and I'm like I thank the Lord Lord the fact that I can be in this comfortable bed it's so comfortable because I know there are brethren that are imprisoned with no mattress it's hardwood, nasty floor. Uh, it's smelly. Um, while serving Christ, suffering that way. Sometimes, you know, with all kinds of things like, Lord, the fact that I have an income right now, um, or your amazing provision, just just randomly, like, it just comes to my mind. I, I can be doing something, I can be, it, just random times where it just comes to my mind and being thankful, Thanksgiving going to him. Uh, kind of is connected to prayer and just like that like 
times where in the shower or random places in the car or waiting for something, just randomly, people come to our mind and praying for people. We should do that. That should be normal. You know, we saw, you know, pray without ceasing. And, you know, we saw, remember, the example of um, in Nehemiah, at the beginning of Nehemiah, he had less than five seconds. The king asked him a question. And in that brief moment, it, it would have been like one, two seconds, probably one, two, three seconds where he would have prayed, oh, God, give me favor. And then he answers the king. So I hope our, you know, relationship, remember, we went over a relationship, which is so foundational. Relationship, relationship, relationship. There's a reason why that is emphasized rightly by a lot of pastors. And that's why I remember over a decade ago where I'm sure we've heard it plenty of times where like Christianity is not a religion, but it's a relationship. Uh, there's even a guy that did our whole rap on that thing and it, it, it kind of exploded like there were like a million views or something. But um, just the fact that relationship is really huge, uh, really based on the Bible over and over and over about knowing him, knowing him. Yeah, we saw that before. So that based on the relationship with God, you naturally end up talking to him and hearing from him, scripture and prayer, which is the foundational thing for the Christian life. And then, uh, yeah, just the fact that I hope there is just constant random, you know, just prayer throughout the day. But the fact that the quote unquote closet prayer, it's really essential. I know depending on where we're at, some of us may you know, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes, some people 30, some people hour or two or more. But I hope we um, have the that inner room, uh, private room prayer times where like with no distraction, maybe a song on or something, maybe a music on, which uh, can be very helpful for, for some people, I guess it depends, but totally focused on him, totally looking to him. And I'll just share something just real quick. Um, Sometimes, uh, sometimes you know, before I pray, and I know plenty of others would know of this too, but sometimes before I open my pa my mouth, you know, I'm kneeling. I might be kneeling. I might be just on my face or something, and I think about my God, who I'm a approaching. So, before I start praying, I'm in a position of prayer. And then I, I think about my God, the God I'm approaching right now, this God, and I'm just silent before him, and uh, wh whether a few seconds or whatever, and then I start praying. And um, this is not as connected, but like in, in Daniel 9, the whole, almost the whole chapter is on prayer, and it says that Daniel... Like he turned his face toward God before he prayed. So in Daniel 9, 3, then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So some translations, I turn my face toward the Lord God or I set my face toward the Lord God. Some translations, uh, I turn my attention, I guess, toward the Lord God. So when you pray, uh, you know, I, I sometimes, I mean, this is my opinion, but I, I kind of, sometimes I, I, I watch like an online sermon and the pastor, when he prays, he might be just talking to the congregation and then like immediately, like without even like a pause before approaching the living God, he just goes, he starts talking. And... You know, people will differ on their opinions, but uh, I, like the passage we see right here in, in Daniel 9, 3, there is something of when you're praying, your attention is going to him. I know in a way that's like so basic, but just like when we're, we're talking with each other, we prefer the person giving our giving us the full attention, right? I'm sure we've experienced it, but like when someone's talking to you, but they're halfway distracted with their phone or some other thing or looking somewhere else and stuff. 
It's a little bit bothersome, it can be. But um, when we approach God in our closet prayer times, sometimes we need to like think about the fact that I'm approaching the living God. You're turning your attention, your full attention toward Him. And, um, and we saw some other things, but uh, unless any thoughts or anything can go to uh, Apostle Paul's prayer for the churches. So if you go, I think, page six, bottom. So yeah, it's, I know I know there are Second Thessalonians, but let's go to the first on the on the bottom. The last one is First Thessalonians. You can go to that one. So in First Thessalonians uh, three uh, nine. So you know Apostle Paul, who was, I know obviously one of the most mature, solid, theologically sound uh, saints that lived. There's, you know, much we can learn from the prayer that he records. So, in this situation, you know, Apostle Paul, he was ripped away from the Thessalonians because uh, the, the unbelieving Jews, they stirred up the crowd and their goal was to get Paul kicked out. And so, he, he and his companions were ripped away from the Thessalonians. And that's the situation. And Paul's writing this letter and sending it through Timothy to them. So, somebody want to read, like, nine... Ten. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Thank you. Sorry, can you go to, down to the end of the chapter? Mm -hmm. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen. So, yeah, it says, What thanks can we render to God for you guys for all the joy with which we rejoice because of you or on your account before our God? So, you know, the Thessalonians, they were either a few weeks old or max a few months old in Christ by this time. But, you know, like we went over, like the whole closeness of the church study, even a stranger, when they're a Christian, the connection in Christ. Um, so when you read Thessalonians, Philippians, uh, you can sense this, this tenderness and this love that Apostle Paul has when you just read the letter. And you can totally see his heart that... Uh, yeah, we get, you know, what things, for what things can we render to God for you guys? For all the joy with which we rejoice because of you guys before our God. They were such a joy to him. And then, how is this love shown? Well, night and day, praying exceedingly. Now, that exceedingly is a strong word in the Greek. I don't know what translation you had, but like, it's, it's just a really strong word, just saying, like praying earnestly, exceedingly. What does it say in your guys? Maybe similar? Pray most earnestly. Okay, most earnestly. Do you see that? Um, that's why the, the, the scholars, the, the Greek scholars, they translated it most earnestly. You know, I, I love that, just even hearing that. Like, do we know something of that? Where you like most earnestly desperately pray maybe I should put this I should put this passage under the desperate prayer so you know one of the things we might go over today is that one of the most biblical like beautiful best expressions of love among the brethren it's love for one another or excuse me it's prayer for one another secret prayer for one another that when you truly care and love this person even unbeliever when you love this unbeliever there's going to be prayer. Uh, so praying exceedingly, most earnestly, that we may see your face and perfect or complete what is lacking in your faith. So here's what we can see. In this situation where Paul and his companions are ripped away from them because they're kicked out because of the unbelieving Jews, they got kicked out of the city, 
he so earnestly prays that, that we may see you guys again. For what purpose? We just want to get together and have fun. What is Zay? Perfect what is lacking in your faith. See, like I said, these, this church was only a few months old, max. And it probably, I, I don't, I mean, from what, what I see, I don't think it could have been more than, I think it, it would have been like three months or less based on just the construction of uh, Acts 17 and things like that. But, um, yeah, max a few months old. So they're definitely, you know, immature in the faith. And with the love that Paul has, he wants to get, he wants to see them again in order to complete what is lacking in their faith because it's not so established well yet and then now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you again he says this and may the Lord make you guys increase and abound in love so okay here he starts going into specifically what he's praying for them like he's going into this is what I wish for you guys may the Lord make you guys increase and abound in love to one another and to all. Uh, we're going to see this in Philippians too. But prayer that they would increase and abound in love to one another. This, this is important. Love among the brethren. And also love to all. I don't know if this would be like other local churches or like unbelievers also, but to all. Just as we do to you just like I think our love for you guys so that he, God may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints so verse 13 so that he may God establishing their hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. So when we did study on Jesus' return, we went over this. The fact that over and over and over, all throughout the New Testament, there's this thing of, at the Lord Jesus' return, being found blameless above reproach. So many passages. Peter has it. Uh, John has it. First John, I think, 3. Second Peter, 3. Uh, Paul has it like many times. There is this thing of, at the coming of the Lord Jesus, being found, right here, holy, blameless, above reproach. And this is tied to the whole sanctification study. That, you know, sanctification, growing in holiness, and Christ-likeness, it's all over the New Testament. You know, there's the whole study on the topic of sanctification. But, um... Paul's prayer was that for them. And actually, uh, you know, if you just go to chapter 5, I know this is not prayer, but he says the same thing. In 523, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Right here, parallel. This thing of at the coming of our Lord Jesus, being found completely holy. The author of Hebrews, in Hebrews 12, 14, he says, Pursue peace with all people, and pursue holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So that truth is tied to these things. Like I said, First John 3, John, he says something kind of very similar about um, becoming like him and like he who hopes in this thing like purifies himself just as he is pure. And so yeah, Paul's prayer, we see. And then uh, the Second Thessalonians 1, he says, uh, so he, he starts out with to this end. So, to get more of the context, like, like we can go to verse 9. So, the unbelievers who persecute Christians, 
These shall be punished with everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day. Okay, Jesus is coming again uh, to be glorified in His saints. So Jesus' return to be glorified in His saints and to be admired or marveled at among all those who have believed. So there's going to be marveling at the Lord when the Lord comes because our testimony among you is believed. And then to this end, so with this in mind, the coming of the Lord, he's going to come with vengeance, punishment on the unbelieving side. And then the believing side, he's going to come for salvation, glorification. Well, to this end, we also pray always for you guys that our God would count you worthy of his calling, number one. So right away, I think we can learn, okay, Lord, I pray for brother so-and-so, I pray for sister so-and-so, that you would make her, you would make him worthy of your calling. See, when Paul says calling, he has in mind that um, like effectual calling or something, uh, basically God calling those whom he chose. God calling his elect. There's a time where he calls them. It's kind of like uh, when in John, uh, Jesus teaches about um, like the father has given to the son whom he chose. So God chose before the foundations of the world, but then uh, the, the father gave them to the son. That thing. So there is a time where we are born again. And that's where, where that's when the, the call is there. That kind of calling and then and we, in a way, become his then. But uh, there is this high calling of God. And Paul's prayer is that God would count them, God would count you, worthy of his calling. So, see, th th this is important. Um, Apostle Paul writes about this kind of thing many times. Like, so many places. In Philippians, Ephesians, uh, maybe Colossians about that you would live in a manner worthy of the calling. It's Ephesians 4. I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all humility, gentleness, patience, etc. So in, in Ephesians 4, it's that you would walk worthy. Paul, uh, he writes to, you know, this probably circular letter, that um, you would walk, you would live worthy of the calling with which you are called. So yeah, very similar. His prayer for the Thessalonians was that God would count them worthy of his calling. So when we see this, right away, of course, the most important part is uh, what does it mean? And uh, when we hear the English word worthy, we think about deserving of, but I think almost all agree that it, it's not deserving of, it just doesn't accord with the rest of the Bible that you try to make yourself deserving of the calling. But uh, fitting would be a good word. I think I've heard of the like illustration or ex explanation of uh, on like a scale, you know, one side you have whatever stuff and then one side you have like weights or whatever and then it balances out. I think I've heard that kind of explanation explanation before. You live in a manner, you become kind of fitting uh, with the calling that it, it kind of, it, it's equal in a way that accords with the calling, that high calling. So Paul is praying that God would count you worthy of his calling. And then to fulfill so there are kind of different translations here, but to uh, fulfill by his power your every desire for goodness. So that's like a lot of translation combination. So that God would fulfill by his power your every desire for goodness. So we, we probably know uh, Ephesians Chapter 2, verse 8, 9, 10, that by grace you are saved through faith, is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of verse, the saying you should boast. Verse 10, 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So that verse 10 right there, the thing is, we are never ever saved by good works, but Paul's point is, God's plan is that you get saved, and now as a new creation in Christ, with a new nature, now you have a desire for good works. And that being fulfilled, those good works are things that God actually uh, prepared beforehand. He, he, he planned it, and you fulfill those good works. That's one of the parts of the Christian life. The Bible teach, teaches a lot about good works. Well, not as much, but like the book of Titus. Like, that's one of the themes of the book of Titus. Good works, good works, good works. There, there's like a, a reactionism against Roman Catholicism and other cults. Because cults teach good works for salvation, the evangelical side, they have many times reacted against that and almost avoid talking about good works. But the thing is, the Bible teaches about good works. It's just that it's never for salvation. And here, when Paul says uh, that God would fulfill, I think this is very similar to the Ephesians 2.10, that God would fulfill by his power your every desire for goodness. Now, this goodness thing, it's positive moral quality characterized especially by interest in the welfare of others. So that's like the definition from lexicon. Positive moral quality characterized, especially by interest in the welfare of others. So I think this goodness, your desire for goodness would be for whether yourself, like bi biblical good things, or for others. So Paul's prayer is that God, may you fulfill their every desire for good things, goodness, and the work of faith by your power. Their actions, I think the word, the word work, uh, I think we tend to think, you know, when we hear works, like, like job works, but work is usually just deed, action. So actions of faith. Because remember, we studied the whole topic of faith, that um, we walk by faith and not by sight. How you live your life, it's a, it's a life of faith. But um, work of faith, actions of faith, as you live your Christian life, that, uh, that God, by his power, would fulfill every desire for goodness, the good things, and then also fulfill the work of faith. And in 1 Thessalonians, one two paul prayed he said that uh we remember your work of faith labor of love endurance of hope in our lord jesus christ so in first thessalonians he had said this this thing of work of faith and here his prayer is that god would fulfill the work of faith and so you know we can think about this is there something of this in my life that i desire good things like biblically good things for for myself and you know for others and um my life of faith actions of faith that by god's power those get fulfilled in my life because paul's pr paul's prayer for them what was that that being fulfilled and then verse 12 this going on so that what's the end that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. This is beautiful. So by this happening, by the by this being fulfilled, your every desire for goodness being fulfilled, and then the work of faith with, with power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you guys. Oh, that's huge. Um, Lord work in this brother work in this sister work in this church in such a way so that by this church you are glorified and then he says and then you guys glorified in him 
Now this is different. This is different, a different kind of glorification. This would be um, you being glorified in him would be like when Jesus comes back, we get to be glorified with the new bodies. So Paul, is this a play on word or I don't know, but the same word glorified is used, but it's a different glorification. And yeah, so the name of our Lord Jesus being glorified in them and then them being glorified in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then um, Colossians 1. Um, so Colossians 1, 9. Uh, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you guys and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord hmm that sounds similar walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience. So, okay, uh, so much here in this prayer. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, so Paul never met the Colossians, but Epaphras in verse like seven, he's the one that pretty much started the church. And he uh, wanted, he visited Paul in prison and he wanted Paul to uh, write this letter to the Colossians, the church that he he planted, the Epaphras planted. And, uh, and he's saying, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard about you guys, we do not cease to pray for you guys. So Paul never met them, but he was earnestly, continually praying for them, asking what, praying what for them? That they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So we did, you know, a study that the third topic we ever did was on the topic of the will of God. And uh, this would be, you know, God's desiderative will. Now, yeah, it's, it's probably that, like what God desires, that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And it's uh, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So knowing God's will, it involves uh, wisdom and spiritual understanding. And verse 10, I think this is, maybe it's connected. It could be that, you know, we pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will so that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Actually, Actually, I think it's connected now that I see it. So, by really knowing God's will well, you're able to walk worthy of the Lord. Now, what does this mean, walking worthy of the Lord? Well, whenever you have a genitive like this, something of something, you have to try to figure it out because there are usually many different possibilities. Now, the context usually makes things more clear, but... Uh, fr from my just study and meditation and thinking based on Paul's theology and what, we, what he would have in mind, I think it would be that you live, you walk in a manner that's worthy, fitting of knowing the Lord, uh, of a person that knows the Lord, that belongs to him. I think that's, that was my conclusion. Lord, I pray that uh, this person would live in a manner that accords with, that fits with a person that really knows you, that's got a revelation of you, a person that belongs to you. So Paul's prayer is that for them, the walking worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. And then uh, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So, yeah, such biblical prayers. I mean, it's, it's the Bible, but uh, you can find this like in many places that uh, 
he wants them to be fully pleasing to the Lord, and then also for them to be fruitful in every good work. Fruitfulness. You know, fruitfulness is, is a somewhat, you know, big topic. We probably would know about like John 15, the vine and the branches, the bearing fruit uh, that glorifies God. Paul will see in Philippians something similar, like the fruit of righteousness. But uh, yeah, just things coming out of our lives, just like a tree bearing fruit, you know, fruit comes out in our life. That which is pleasing to the Lord coming out. That which is biblical coming out that glorifies God. It's pleasing to Him. So being fruitful in every good work. uh, You see good work here. And increasing in the knowledge of God. So we don't know like how old this church was, but um, probably not as old. But uh, Paul's prayer that they would increase in the knowledge of God to have a more and more correct, good understanding of God, increasing in the knowledge of God, and then strengthen with all power according to his glorious might. This strengthening that he prays, strengthen with all power according to his glorious might, but for what purpose? That's important. Because you might get the wrong understanding if you just if you just read that part, uh, strengthened with all power. So what is that for? It's for all endurance and patience. It's this. In the midst of persecution, Paul wants them to be spiritually strong and firm so that they can endure through persecution and hardship. Okay? You know, if you just read the Bible, you know about persecution, suffering of the saints. It's a given. It's a promise in the New Testament. There are too many passages to go to. Jesus teaching it, you'll suffer for my sake. You know, if you are my follower, you're, the world's going to hate you. You're going to suffer. Blessed are those who, are, who suffer for righteous, righteousness, snake, beatitude. Paul, Peter, John, everyone, Jude, Revelation, martyrdom in the book of Acts. Suffering is a given. The world will hate you. So here, this strengthening, according to his glorious might, it's for all endurance. And the moment you hear endurance, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know what this is talking about. Enduring in the faith. Endurance and patience. You know, this is the prayer needed, uh, the, 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 what the brethren need. The brethren need this, this prayer that are suffering. Uh, you know, we live in a region where we don't really suffer. But, um, I mean, the brethren that lose family members, that are persecuted... You know, me with my housemate situation, there's like nothing. It is like a joke compared to the brethren that are um, in areas where there's this somewhat of a... Sometimes they they are in constant fear because they can just break in and they can do something to them. But yeah, they need prayer for, for endurance to be strengthened so that they can endure through the faith. In, your, uh, in, in the faith. and But also, he says, with joy, giving thanks to the Father. This would be included in the prayer, that they would have joy, that they would with joy, give thanks to the Father. Now, this is kind of tricky, because uh, with joy, does that go with the earlier part? Verse 11? That they would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for you know endurance and patience, and also with have joy. Or is Paul saying with joy giving thanks to the Father? Either way, I mean it's not as big of a difference, but I think more translations have uh, with joy giving thanks to the Father. So even in the midst of persecution that'll be around that they would be able to, with joy, give thanks to the Father, thanksgiving. Uh, and then, you know, with, with it in mind that the Father has qualified you to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and the light. So the prayer is over. So, yeah, we can learn very much from such prayers. Should we look at the Philippians? Philippians is pretty similar, but... Philippians 1, 9, 11. So... 
you know, the Philippians, uh, very close with Paul, close relationship. Paul planted this church years ago. And uh, starting with Lydia uh, in Acts 16. And, I mean, the, the Philippian jailer, he was probably a part of this church. Uh, and the whole household. Uh, probably Lydia along with, uh, if she had slaves. Yeah, possibly the, the slaves also included. But um, to this church, uh, he, he writes, um, And this I pray, number one, that your love may abound still more and more. So remember what we saw in Thessalonians, he prayed that their love like would abound or something like that. Increasing in love for one another and for all, we saw that. So yeah, that your guys' love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. So while he, he wants their love to abound, along with that, also abounding in knowledge. So correct understanding knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent. Okay, the reason for knowledge and all discernment is that they would be able to approve what really matters. So my translation has uh, the things that are excellent, but this is basically just um, to be able to like discern what's superior what's more important. And so that's why uh, that you may approve the things that really matter. That's one suggestion for translation. And then like NIV and such, approve what is best, right? It says what is best. And so what's really important, that's his prayer. That by increasing in knowledge and all discernment, that they may uh, approve, recognize, know what actually matters. I mean, I, I did a study today with Proverbs and, and such, but uh, one of the things was, you know, in, in Proverbs, it goes into, it, with the whole thing of wisdom, we need to be able to learn what's really important, what really matters. Because... All around us, most people are caught up in what's not important, what's a work, what's worthless, what's just going to fade away. See, you know, the world will invest in, put their time and money and their life into the things that is worthless in eternity. That's reality. And in their view, the Christian life is a wasteful, worthless life. The biblical Christian life. Because, you know, I went over this during, you know, Noah and the flood study. Noah's family are all about this ark that saves. The world sees that and sees that they're just wasting their life. What on earth are they doing? Building this humongous thing, spending decades on this thing. For the world, remember Jesus said this in Luke, Luke 17 or 19 or so, where in those days they were building and they were like, you know, getting married and this and that and all that stuff that the world was doing. And uh, one day when the flood comes, it's they're, they're gone. 1726 of Luke, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And then verse 28, likewise, it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on, that, on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will... It be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So, biblically, Christians are occupied with the gospel, what actually matters in eternity, not laying up treasure on earth, but in heaven, what's actually important in eternity, but to the world, they're wasting their life. So that's how it is set. So, 
Paul just prays here that they would be able to discern what really matters, what's really important. And I hope we're more and more throughout our Christian journey that's been happening. Be very careful of surrounding influence, including the Christian community, sadly, uh, the influence around. So Paul's prayer is that. And he says uh, that you may be sincere and without offense for the day of Christ. Hmm. Interesting. Did we go over that? You see it again with the Thessalonians. What we saw in Thessalonians. He prays that they would be pure. It's sincere or pure. Hmm. That has to do with holiness. And blameless. For the day of Christ. You see this again. Being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are uh, by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Someone just say something? That, that's tied to, um, you know, being worthy of the calling, right? Um, being pure and blameless for the day of Christ, like being worthy of the calling you've received from the other passage. Similar? Um, I, I think there would be overlap and such, but I, I just had in mind, you know, in, in Thessalonians, in 3.13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus, that return of the Lord, and on the day of his return, being found blameless above reproach, that whole thing. And that's why we went to chapter 5 also. Now may the God of peace sanctify you completely, and may your whole uh, spirit, soul, body be found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that whole thing. Jesus is returned the day of the Lord, and on that day being found blameless, holy, above reproach. That thing. That, it's like the same kind of thing. That you may be sincere and blameless for the day of Christ. So Paul has in mind the day of Christ, Jesus' return, and when he comes, being a holy, blameless, above reproach. He prays that. And then being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Uh, being filled with the fruit of righteousness. So, I think Paul has in mind uh, fruit of righteousness, just in the sense of fruit of righteousness. So, righteous fruit, like good fruit coming out. So, you know, this is kind of like, you know, the, the good deeds. Again, you know, good fruit coming out, good deeds. And that is by Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus that good works can come out. So, um, so I think it'd be nice to just briefly go over like good works. So, what does Paul have in mind with good works? Uh, so one of the huge things I think would be love for the brethren, actions, uh, those good works. Maybe things like um, involvement in ministry, just uh, with evangelism, things like that. Um, Helping out with one another, with um, service for one another, uh, especially you know brethren that are more directly doing God's work, um, supplying them, helping them out, uh, hospitality, especially in this in this context. Yeah, those things, those wonderful good fruit coming out. Yeah, so. He prayed that uh, they would be filled with the fruit of righteousness, righteous fruit, righteous acts. And um, like John writes in 1 John that one of the evidences that you have been born again is that you have righteousness, righteous acts that come out of your life. In 1 John, uh, I think end of chapter is it 2 or 3, uh, in 1 John 2.29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does righteousness has been born of him. You hear that? You know that if he is righteous, you know that everyone who does righteousness has been born of him. So if you're born again, you do have righteous works. You do righteousness. Uh, good works. 
So here, uh, Paul's prayer, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, righteous fruit coming out, righteous deeds. And then we know that that is only through Jesus. We of ourselves uh, cannot produce good works except through Jesus. This is such a parallel. I I'm sure most pastors, if they were teaching this, they have to go to John 15, vine of the branches, where Jesus says, you know, abide in me, I in you, as a branch that cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Um, I, am the I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. So very interesting parallel. The fruit of righteousness is only by Jesus Christ. And this is all unto the glory and praise of God. It's unto God's glory. So yeah, very much to learn. And, you know, I think the Ephesians one, we'll do it next time. But, uh, so any, any thoughts on the, the bottom, just the question, like, what can we learn from Paul's prayers for the churches, saints? Just the earnestness of them is so evident. Um, you can just tell that he's very concerned about all of the churches, you know. It's not, it's not just platitudes, I guess. Especially like with the Colossian church, he said that he never actually went there. I didn't I didn't know that actually. Um, so that's interesting to learn that he had that kind of prayer having never met them before. Yeah. Um, yeah, in chapter 2, 1 of Colossians, for I want you to know what a great struggle I have for you guys and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh there, that's a little hint there uh, but right before the prayer he kind of says that he mentions that you guys learned about the grace of God the, the gospel from Epaphras our dear, our dear fellow servant uh, so yeah we yeah, it's it's clear that yeah he never met them, but yeah he had such a heart for them. He even says that he struggles for them in chapter two one, uh, with earnest prayer and such. Because you know Paul's imprisoned. In a way, he can't do anything, but he can do what's extremely huge, prayer. So that's the thing about prayer, that God set it up in such a way where even if we're chained, even if they take away our Bibles. Even if uh, I'm in some whatever place in the world, I mean, any place where you're there in a dungeon, underground, where you're outer space for some reason, you're wherever, you have access to God. That's how God set it up to be. And, you know, one of the things we went over is to not, quote unquote, take advantage of prayer. It's just absurd. It's like, it's like wrong. It's like, how can you, this is not some human king. This is the God of the universe that he has free access to. That that needs to so hit us. So yeah, to not take advantage, it's just makes no sense. But uh, yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, when I uh, read Paul's prayer, I just get to so learn, like, prayer is what's truly in our hearts coming out. You know, laying it out before God. And so, we don't want to like just, you know, just like the Lord's prayer, the Lord's teaching on prayer. We don't want to just like repeat the words or something, you know, seeing Paul's prayer and just repeat it, you know, em emptily if that's a word. But I hope that we come to a place of maturity where more and more there are these things that we learn and naturally we end up praying these things for the brethren around us. Like, you naturally start praying, Lord, I pray for brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. Uh, in light of your return, they would all the more become blameless, above reproach, and holy, separated from the world, uh, in light of your coming. Lord, I pray that uh, they would uh, be fruitful in every good work. That good works would come out of their lives. We saw Second Thessalonians 1, that right there. Um, Lord, I pray that they would not only increase in love, 
Paul prayed that. Thessalonians, Philippians. I pray that he would, she would increase in love toward you, toward the brethren, but also increase in knowledge and discernment so that he, she would uh, be able to discern what really matters. There's so many trivial, flippant, worthless things around us. But Lord, please, let this brother gain discernment so that he doesn't waste his life. He wastes his time uh, less and less and gets caught up in what really matters. Lord, the things in my life, the things in his life that are really not worth the time, Lord, let it be removed. Let it be, let it be gone. So learning from such prayers. And um, like, just if you go down, because this is kind of related to this, but if you go down, um, different kinds of prayer, I bottom of page eight, with different kinds of prayer examples in the Bible, just uh, the, the, the third one, one of the actions, expressions of love among brethren, secret prayer for one another, is one of the best expressions of love among the brethren. I would say it's one of the most important and best expressions of love. It's huge. And you notice I put secret prayer for one another. It's not that uh, it has to be secret. You know, sometimes it's helpful when you let people know you are praying for them because you really are praying for them. Now I am, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I hope that no one like lies and says they're praying for somebody when they're not because that's just straight up sin to lie. But I hope that uh, very, very often there's, you know, I'm praying for you. I hope it's not just like a very quick, you know, your heart's not really in it, just quick little prayer, that kind of thing, but like real earnest praying that there is. It's very interesting. Uh, you know, remember we saw like in First Thessalonians about like Paul like, earnestly praying remember how we saw that well in Colossians actually in Colossians chapter 4 at the end of Colossians it says uh, 412 so Epaphras who is one of you a bondservant of Christ greets you always laboring fervently for you guys in prayers okay Epaphras is the one that planted the church and um Paul is writing this letter saying he's always my, my translation laboring fervently for you guys in prayers prayers plural but the laboring fervently that Greek word agonizomai where we get agonize it's generally to fight struggle the Greek word I don't know what translation you have but it means to fight to struggle of wrestling and prayer so that's what the the word means so I, I think your translation might have like struggling or fighting wrestling and prayer those are good translations what do you guys have wrestling yeah so that that's a good translation so think about it I mean I'm not trying to like mock or like you know whatever because I, I know that you know people can be sincere but it's like it's just but when they just, you know, like, you know, a one-liner, just quick little five-second prayer, um, it's not like that here. I think we can learn from even just statements like this. Would your prayer for other brethren be described as wrestling in prayer, fighting and struggling? Because that's how Paul described Epaphras' prayer for the church, Colossian church. And it says, always striving, struggling for you guys in prayers, plural, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. And then like next verse, for I bear him witness that he has worked hard or the word, um, this Greek word, it means work that involves much exertion or trouble. So work hard, I guess. Okay. Work hard, toil. 
for you guys and those who are in Laodicea and in Heropolis. So yeah, uh, such an expression, demonstration of love for the brethren in prayer. Earnest, fervent. You know, we, we saw the wrestling, I think, uh, is it two weeks ago? The Jacob uh, wrestling. And um, he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Now, I mean, that was kind of a, I would say kind of a self-centered kind of thing, but the earnestness and the, the struggling with God, the fervent aspect, that is something we can learn there in the wrestling. But uh, So, yeah, one of the wonderful and best expressions of love among brethren, secret prayer for one another. Uh, so, to, to share a quick little testimony for me, I'm quite certain that my bridge was, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure, pro even till this day, there would have never been in my life where I received so much prayer. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. And so, just one day, I, I feel, you know, my, my head just crazy headache and, you know, vomiting, all that stuff, and then ER and everything, and then my sister gets the news of uh, what, what's going on with me, and then through her, my parents find out, and then the pastor at that time of the church I was a part of, he would have let probably congregations know, uh, and then like on Facebook, um, people like, you know, kind of updating on what's going on and then prayer through that. And um, what happened was my mom, my mom and dad. So first my mom hears from my sister about uh, the bridge. She gets the news. So I, I heard uh, she hears the news and then, so, okay, I don't know how much I should share, but my mom was close to this one sister at that time who clearly had a gift of prophecy. And um, she, I guess she told my mom that something's going to happen soon. She doesn't know what, but God is like preparing her to like pray and fast or something like that. She either already started fasting or she uh, knew that that was going to come soon. And so that had already happened. And then my mom gets the news in Korea and... Um, that sister was the first person she called and that sister knew oh this is what it was and so she started fasting for me and then um you know my mom i'm sure she didn't feel like eating uh, but she probably would have you know prayed and fasted for me and then my my at that time my, my father was in a deacon's meeting in in church because he was a deacon at that time and so my sister's like you know it's very urgent because like they're saying, you know, we don't know, we don't know the chance of him living and that kind of stuff. Because they didn't know exactly what was going on. And my sister, um, she was like, I guess, kind of panicking and like, you know, at least let's let dad know. But mom is saying, look, he's in a deacon's meeting, so once he's done, we'll let him know. But I guess my sister sent a through a messenger. So. My sister, through like a messenger, sent a message to my dad. And this is God's providence, how it works. My dad is in a de deacon's meeting. I don't know how many people. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm picturing at least 20 people, maybe more, because this is a big church. I don't know, maybe up to like 40 or something. But my dad, he has his phone, I guess, underneath. And he sees a message, you know, uh, of his son who went to the hospital with like a uh, bleeding. So I guess he checked his phone. And then I guess a deacon next to him saw that message. And deacon so-and-so's son is this, in this kind of situation. And so I guess they like prayed for me. And then um, it became known in the church. And uh, uh, the, ch the church is a really big church um, in Korea, um, uh, several thousand. And then uh, they have, you know, Friday night, uh, Friday night, night church services and uh, the, the senior pastor, he uh, made an announcement and had a time of prayer, like for me. And the, so the whole church, like praying, uh, having a time of like uh, unison prayer, like crying out, that kind of prayer. And then also, um, my mom, um, so this is fascinating how it works, but 
my mom told me that uh, I think at least twice, um, like after the service, she had some ladies come up to her and say, "Hey, are you uh, that that one so and so's like mother?" Like w- with the announcement that there was about like, "Are you that mother?" And she's like, "Yes." And I think it was at least two ladies that told her, you know, God has like put it on my heart to pray and fast for your son. And uh, they didn't know me. They didn't know my mom. But God, they, they said that God just burdened me to pray and fast for your son. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I never, uh, I, I don't know these women, but um, yeah, may the Lord uh, bless them for their heart. But uh, not only the surgery going well, but one of the re- really important parts that I want to share is I probably shared with you guys that uh, during my recovery time after the surgery, where I had about six months in Korea just recovering, it was one of the most uh, spirit-filled times of my Christian life. And I believe that the prayer was the reason. Other than when I was first born again, and the first few years were like, you know, passionate on fire, it was one of the most spirit-filled, like, on fire times of my Christian life. And I believe it's the prayers of the saints, where I had, you know, thousands that prayed for me, and people that fasted for me. So just, uh, you know, the quotes, I don't know where I put it, but just that prayer is one of the most important, worthy ways you can spend your time literally on this planet while you live. Okay? It's so huge. That's no exaggeration. It's not. It's true. It's truth. That out of everything you can be doing while, while you're alive on this earth, during your lifetime. One of the most important ways you can spend your time is prayer. Um, Where you're going to the living God. And in a way, you're having the living God move. It is so important and huge. And God set it up that way. Prayer is not something that people invented. It's something that God came up with that my people will have access to me in whatever situation, for whoever. Uh, That they don't have to travel anywhere. They don't have to earn my favor, like to have access to me. Anytime, any place, in any situation regarding anything, they can approach me in prayer. Yeah, uh, just that part about how prayer is that huge, that it can make such a difference. Uh, just, I mean, I, <laughs> that season where in Korea, like amazing times in the, you know, with the Lord in my room, just studying again and spiritually recovering, amazing times. Uh, here and there going out open or preaching and um, evangelizing different places and just filled with the spirit and having amazing times in his presence. Um, where just the presence of God, amazing, indescribable, and just weeping, there being times like that, and just amazing. And there's no other explanation. It's got to be the prayer of the saints. So, yeah, any uh, thoughts, questions, or anything you want to share before we end? There have been... uh several times um, our church has done they they call it 24 hour prayer where there's people that will commit to praying for an hour and like a lot of people in the church will participate and people will pray at different times throughout the day for something specific so you know for days or for a week it's there's someone praying for something for that entire time, um, you know, for an hour at a time or something like that. So um, we do that. Um, that's, I think, a really good thing. I think just having a lot of people all in one accord praying for something is really powerful. 
Yeah, uh, it's wonderful to hear that. Um, you know, I mean, to tell you my opinion, a church that doesn't pray is a dead church. And I know much of the church would agree with me the past 2,000 years. A church that doesn't pray, it really reveals something about the church. And the sad thing is, I know in the 20th century, in the 1900s, there were much more prayer meetings for churches. But these days, it's very rare to find churches that get together to pray. That, that's reality. Um, but um, yeah, uh, it's just such a core, core part. Um, in Acts 2.42, they continued, the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers, plural. The four things that kind of make up a church in a way, the activities, the things that make up a church, um, prayers. And if you look at the end of this Bible study note, I think I have prayers in the book of Acts. But uh, you can see a record and it just, it's helpful. Yeah, uh, so yeah, today we got to do a review and got to see some things and then saw Apostle Paul's prayers uh, that really God set it up to where um, prayer is a huge, huge thing, so, so essential and important. Uh, Martin Luther, he had a couple, I saw a couple quotes from him, I didn't put here, but just... Uh, and I, I, I never knew of that quote, but I have written the same thing before, but Martin Luther wrote, and, and you know, just for some that may not know which Martin Luther I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the American Martin Luther, but I'm talking about, you know, the reformer Martin Luther in the what, 1500s, that like, like today I'm so busy that I need to start out the day with like three hours of prayer. But I know that may sound kind of like boastful or whatever, but he, he wouldn't have been boasting. Uh, but the other one is what I had in mind that he, he said, um, like prayer is like breath, uh, breathing, um, like spiritually, uh, something of that he said. And yeah, uh, so yeah, I hope that uh, our prayer life is just gets better and better and um, based on our relationship with him and uh, the spirit fullness, being spiritful, spirit filled and such, um, that so helps us uh, pray. So yeah. And I, I, I want to send a sermon for you guys. Uh, I hope you guys watch it. It's pretty amazing. Um, quite amazing things uh, done uh, with prayer. Like a pastor shares about amazing things that have been done um, with this church that just had a really uh, good they were mature in prayer, I guess. They, yeah, and, and he shares about a lot of amazing supernatural things that happen. If there isn't anything, I can pray in. Lord God, uh, thank you for the blessed time to get, go into your word and to learn what we can learn from your word. Lord God, Apostle Paul's prayers. Indeed, Lord, how he would have spent so much time based on his relationship, closeness with you, going to you in prayer, turning his eyes, turning his attention toward you, Oh, I'm sure he would have just, he would have so much time where he just gets alone to be with you, to get, get on his knees or get on his face and just cry out to you with all kinds of different situations that he dealt with, he experienced. Oh, Lord God, um, Lord, how the apostles said that, um, we need these seven men to serve the tables because we have to give ourselves to the word of God and prayer that they did not have time to serve the tables because they needed to preach and teach and pray. Oh Lord, uh, how you set it up in such an amazing, in a way, fascinating way for us to have access to you, whether Old Testament or New Testament, to get to approach the living God, no matter what situation, no matter where we're at, uh, no matter what situation, that we have access to at any time. Lord God, may we uh, just be reminded of this huge thing and spend our time so wisely in praying and seeking you, knowing that it's never, not a single second in prayer is vain. 
unlike so many other things in life where it can be so wasteful. Lord God, uh, empower us by our spirit to pray in the Holy Spirit. Lord, I know it's just so helpful. It's so necessary. When we are not full of the spirit, it's so dry and dead. It's so hard to be motivated to pray. I know that by experience. But Lord, seasons where we're full of the spirit, it's so much more enjoyable and easy to just, we want to have time with you naturally, uh, where we have a song on or something and we naturally are led to worship, sing to you and then pray. Or other times, just spontaneously, random times, where we just pray to you, where we approach you in prayer. Lord God, uh, even now, um, all the prayers that are going up as incense before you, thank you for hearing. And Lord God, various situations, Lord. Lord, with all that we can learn by Paul's example, your word is sufficient. It even has the record of all these prayers. Lord Jesus, your prayer life, what you prayed, the content, uh, your teaching on prayer, and Apostle Paul's example, uh, just word recorded. Lord God, um, oh Lord, uh, may we uh, mature in the faith, mature in our understanding, biblical uh, construction of the world that we would have in our minds with what really matters, what really matters, what's really important in this life, this short life we have, where we can be gone any day. Uh, our minds and our hearts being occupied with the things that are really important. Lord, the influence is so great around us. That's many times pagan influence, worldly influence of wasting life, wasting time. But help us, Lord, that we would all the more be occupied. We would all the more enjoy the things of God, your presence, the things that actually matter. Yet it would become less and less discipline and more and more desire and passion. Lord God, whether myself, others. Lord God, if he uh, has a wrong theology with Roman Catholicism, please uh, save him out and may he truly know things correctly with the biblical church. Correct theology, correct understanding of truth, which is so essential. Lord God, of various things that we lack in. Lord, Paul prayed for the Thessalonians that he made perfect, he made complete what is lacking in their faith. Lord, I know we have deficiencies. All of us are in different places with different deficiencies, different uh, uh, things that need to be tweaked and things that need to be corrected, a wrong understanding of things or our lack in this area, that area. Lord God, I pray for biblical love, which I think will be the next topic we study. The biblical understanding of love, uh, learning from you, learning from your word, uh, increasing, abounding in love, Paul prayed. Lord, I pray for biblical love for ourselves also. Uh, passion toward you, love toward you, and lo love for the brethren, and love for the neighbors. Uh, biblical love. And to be able to evangelize well, effectively, empowered by your spirit. The words that we would have, even though we don't prepare in advance, that your spirit would give us the words to speak and evangelize, Lord. Lord God, those who are actively evangelizing, empower them by your spirit. Give them words, give them signs and wonders so that they would show, demonstrate that this gospel is real. That you are backing it up by signs and wonders. Uh, Lord, um, give us the gifts. Your word says to desire spiritual gifts. Earnestly desire the gifts and uh, desire love. But uh, Lord God, um, give us the gifts so that we can bring edification to the church and minister effectively, Lord, for you and for the body of Christ for evangelism, being a, a light. And um, Lord God, uh, various people uh, with uh, family members that are sick or different things like that, please show mercy and give the right perspective. Some, some people preparing for death, thinking about life and death and preparing for eternity, I pray for. And uh, having the right attitude before you to not sin against you, Lord. Uh, I think um, Ace family, Lord, to have the right perspective in light of the death um, uh, of this loved one, to, to have the right perspective and the church uh, function well, Lord. So, Lord, I thank you for this time um, that you have given. Lord, um, may we learn and may our, our, our Friday, Saturday, Sunday, on and on, Lord God, our time in prayer just increase, may we grow in our uh, dependency of you, our times with you, quantity and quality, and uh, just just like Neil shared about the church, more and more uh, just 
naturally getting together and then resulting in prayer. Lord God, so thank you for this time. All to your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.